Good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, I'll give you a, a quick bio, um, since I understand all of you are interested in, in the energy industry and, and my particular view of it, um, the fascinating part. But, uh, I've been doing clean energy uh, virtually my entire career. Um, I got interested in it as an undergraduate and had the great pleasure as a grad student to um, have the founding chairman of the Electric Power Research Institute, Chauncey Starr, as my faculty advisor. Incredibly phenomenal, intelligent man and wide ranging in his interests and really sparked an interest for me in a lot of things that we now call clean energy. We didn't call it clean energy back then. Uh, but over the course of my career, I, I had opportunity to work for consulting companies that did research and pulled uh, information together for new, um, at that point, it was the, the um, we're known as criteria pollutants, uh, SOX, NOX, and the like, when those, when the EPA was first regulating those. I ended up uh, shortly after that, being the inaugural director of the solar applications unit at a company that was then called Carolina Power and Light. It's gone through a few other names since then. Um, uh, and then I uh, spent a good decade uh, or so doing energy efficiency in the nonprofit arena with an organization here in North Carolina called Advanced Energy. Um, before leaving there and joining state government, that was during the, the Great Recession. Um, I was, came on board as the assistant secretary of the Department of Commerce for energy. And it was my job to spend $360 million of stimulus money coming from the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, a much harder task than we might actually think it would be um, to, to do that and, and do it well. Um, I, I left that and uh, joined, a, which is when I really got involved in, in, in solar in a big way, joined a solar company called Strata Solar, headquartered uh, here in Research Triangle. Um, and when which is when the solar industry really took off. Strata was one of the big drivers of that. I was one of the architects of that very pro thing. It was, a, it was a rocket ship ride and great fun. Left there about five years ago and joined Ecoplex. It's doing essentially the same thing, uh, doing construction. Uh, and now I, I focus uh, specifically on the don't own part. Um, and for quite a while, particularly Strata, I was involved in the policy side of things. Um, at the legislature, as, as many of you know, the energy industry is highly regulated. And so political matters make a big difference to the fortunes of companies involved in that. And so I spent a lot of time at the North Carolina legislature and at various times I'd be walking the halls wondering, what the heck am I doing here? I trained as an engineer and in business, um, not in, in um, lobbying and in policy, but um, enjoyed it in an important sort of thing. But what I want to do today is talk about the solar industry. I'll give you some, sort of an overview of where things have been and where they're going. Um, and then get into some of the nuts and bolts of what's it take to build and operate a, a solar farm and some of what we do on a, on a daily basis. I certainly entertain, would be happy to entertain your, your questions uh, as we go. But I always start uh, these presentations with a quiz. Now, since we're not live, I can't really you know, see your reactions, but I want to ask the question at the top of the page here. What time of day was this picture taken? I'm curious, you know, how you, your logic, but the answer is it was taken early in the morning. How do we know that? Well, solar arrays face south. And so um, south is effectively to the right in this picture. So when I snapped it, I was obviously, if south was to the right, I obviously was facing east. And that's where the sun is rising. So um, when you're on a solar farm, it's usually pretty easy to tell which way uh, south is. Because that's typically where the, the modules at least on a fixed tilt farm track. Well, what I really want to start with is this eye chart. Please don't strain your eyes trying to read it, um, but it's it's really illustrative of what's happened in the solar industry and why solar is on such a tear at this point. If you look in the upper left, you'll see that solar uh, was at one point the highest cost energy. This is tracking it on what's called the LCOE, the levelized cost of energy, which is a, mean, a financial means to sort of uh, um, compare different technologies. And, you, and if you look at the right, you can see there's gas peakers, nuclear, solar, thermal, coal, geothermal, combined cycle, wind, and solar. Um, and what's happened is solar went from 2009, when it was the most expensive uh, form of new generation, to uh, today, where it is the least expensive form of new generation. And obviously, when that happens to the product that you're um, building or selling, uh, great things happen in the marketplace. And that's exactly what's happened to solar. It's, it's just taken off like a rocket ship. Um, and now 
is um, increasingly becoming a dominant uh, or predominant part of our energy supply picture. Here in North Carolina, this is what it looked like starting back in about 2010. That's when I joined the solar industry, left, left state government, um, and rode the rocket ship uh, that resulted from that. Um, as you can see, and, and basically that, that a lot of that growth from 2010 to 2014 was primarily the company I was with. We figured it out first, um, and then by 2015, a bunch of other players jumped in, figured out saw what we were doing, and, and jumped in. Um, there was a trade um, tariff that was put on solar in 2015, which results in a dip there, and then it rebounded and, and started growing again in 2017. A, bit, a lot, a big part of the driver was the fact that module prices were just continuing to drop wholesale. In 2017, the North Carolina legislature changed the rules, and so it was no longer possible to do the same sort of unbridled um, construction of solar that we'd seen before. It was much more constrained. And so what you see now is, is essentially the grandfather project being built, and then some smaller quantity that are coming on as new uh, projects. Uh, but North Carolina, which is currently number two in the nation and installed solar as a result of that tremendous growth early on. We'll probably relinquish that, that position. We'll never catch California. Um, and there are other states with good solar resource that are, are now starting to, to do solar. Uh, but for now, North Carolina is number two in the nation. As you can see there at the top, just uh, about six and a half percent of our electricity is generated from solar. Looking across the nation and what we can expect going forward, um, this is from uh, Wood McKenzie, which basically follows the energy industry and shows uh, what's shown here is essentially the renewables part of it, that wedge that's occurring. And a couple points to be made here is, is you see that renewable energy, wind, both onshore and offshore, and solar are going to continue to grow. Uh, hydro, which is also a clean source, is, is relatively constant. Um, um, and what's interesting is the fact as they grow, the residual demand for thermal generation will continue to decline. It's been declining and, and will continue to decline. But it's important to note that even by this projection, even out by 2039, so you know, good, almost 20 years from now, that conventional generation sources will still account for close to half of what we um, generate, we use to generate electricity. Um, there are people that will argue that we'll see a faster transition, and others will argue there'll be a slower transition, but the point being is we're not going to get away from thermal generation in the immediate future, but we will continue to see continued growth in, in renewables. Um, another really interesting development, and one that I think will, will cause us to grow, is, uh, is the large energy users have really started um, saying, we want clean energy. And this is one listing of companies in the um, solar capacity that they have put in, they've installed at their facilities and the like. Another ex interesting example is, is the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, REBA, that um, basically has come out um, in the past five years or so, uh, assembling uh, a number of, these are mostly tech companies, the Googles, Facebooks, Amazons of, of the world, Microsoft, and as you can see here, that's some pretty tremendous growth in just four years' time. But the 2020 years is just through April, so it's not a, a full year shown there. But uh, these are players that are buying um, solar and wind uh, energy uh, directly you know, from the producers. Um, what we see is, in some cases, for those companies that have facilities, this being IKEA, they have uh, solar on many of their roofs. They've chosen to put it on their buildings and, and use it that way. The, the, those of you that know the store in Charlotte, it has a solar array on it. I can attest that there's a really beautiful view of the downtown skyline from that roof um, because we were the ones that built that array on that site. For the larger tech companies, they um, are generally running data centers and the like, and so that they don't have a lot of roof space as the retail folks do. And so generally what they're doing is contracting with independent power producers from facilities such as this. This is one that the Ecoplexus owns and operates um, up in the northeast part of the state in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Um, and they're buying power from essentially off-site renewables um, and then wheeling it to their uh, facilities. I'll talk more about this uh, particular facility 
uh, a little bit and point out some of its features uh, and the like. But one of the things that you'll find is that these larger sites are out in rural parts of the state. One of the big stories, particularly here in North Carolina, is the economic development opportunity uh, that is created in rural parts of the state. Um, looking at this chart, this shows the revenue, the tax revenue to counties and local jurisdictions before and after this, I think it's 10 counties here, but, so they, we have more, but they got a little too cluttered. You see the little green bar running along the bottom. That was the tax revenue before solar facility was built, and the blue bar is the tax revenue that those counties received uh, after the solar facilities were, were built. Um, basically what happens is the, is the sites come out of an agricultural exemption. They're no longer um, granted the favorable tax status for agricultural exemption. Um, and they're taxed. They, they do get a um, avoidance of property tax uh, in the initial years. Uh, but even so, as you can see here, the amount of tax revenue goes up dramatically for the local jurisdictions. There's a legislator um, from Johnson County who's a former member of the um, school board there who basically said um, solar has allowed the school board to hire new teachers because of the revenue that came into the county. Well, I had a conversation no good eight years or so ago with the economic developer in Warren County up in a very um, impoverished part of the state in northeast of North Carolina. And he had indicated the solar farm that we built there was the first increase in the tax base that county had seen in over a decade that they basically had seen industry leaving and as a result, solar came in um, and really started to refill the coffers of the local government. Of course, the landowners that we lease the land from like it as well because they get a nice um, lease, steady lease income without the vagaries of the stock market or the vicissitudes of, of weather and, and how crops come, come through. Um, and so the, the, the local players have a great benefit from it in addition to those of us that are using the clean energy that comes from it. What I want to do now is shift us to talk a little bit about the construction of, of a solar site. I have a little bit of a video I'll run, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, you'll have to forgive. This is a, a snippet off our website, so our web creators got, got very creative with the, uh, with the audio here, so we'll get some, some nice music to go along with the uh, construction of solar site. <laughs> And when you really get down to it, building a solar farm is like a giant erector set. Um, this is an example of a solar farm built as it was in, in construction. Um, and basically the way they're built is those posts are driven into the ground. That's the foundation. There's, there's no concrete or anything else. And they just are literally pounded into the ground. Now, if there's rock or other, like you'll end up drilling and uh, using a different type of foundation. But here in North Carolina, in most sites, it's just a driven post. Uh, foundation and then the other parts are bolted on. This is all very much manual labor uh, to do this um, and create the racking structure. And then, as you saw in the video, basically what you have are modules that then are bolted uh, to that. The real action in the construction of a solar farm though goes on underground. Solar is a relatively diffuse energy source, and these uh, arrays will cover acres and acres of ground. And all that energy needs to get collected and eventually put on the grid at a singular uh, point of interconnection. And so the energy is, uh, modules are strung together in strings. Uh, the cables run underneath the, the modules in the rack. When they get to the end of the row, they then drop underground and then they come to a, a collection point such as you see here. And so all of those gray pipes, um, uh, my cursor is, uh, are the, uh, the, where the cables from the array will, will come in. What goes on this, uh, this will be refilled and, and a concrete pad poured on top of it. What goes on top of that is, is an inverter. Uh, and the inverter takes the DC electricity that comes off of the array and converts it to AC electricity. Um, 
And so in this case, the, the, the power is coming in in this um, cabinet here and then through the inverter. And eventually, you know, after this picture was taken, a, a step up transmitter will go right where this garbage can is located. Uh, and these large cables will be connected. Those will carry the uh, uh, power from the transformer to um, the grid. So the transformer is basically designed to step up the voltage coming out of the inverter to the voltage of whatever the local distribution system is. Uh, these smaller pipes that you see here in the foreground, those are for various con you know, controls and instrumentations. We typically put up a weather station uh, and have other control. Uh, so those are uh, fiber optic, ethernet, and things of that sort um, that we use to operate the farm. Of course, when you're doing construction, there's other things that happen. And, and I've, I've been doing this now for 10 plus years. And so we'll share with you some of the more interesting, colorful parts of it. Here are two. Um, the picture on the left is uh, this fellow didn't like the disruption as we were clearing the site. And so um, took to the trees. And I'm told by a colleague who knows snakes very, very well that this is a native to North Carolina. I wish I could remember what it is. I'll have to call him at some point and ask him, but you see a rather large uh, critter um, basically fleeing from the construction. The one on the right is um, some things that happen on a solar farm. Ironically, um, this forklift was laying down those um, logging mats that you see on the left there so that vehicles would not get stuck in the mud. Um, and we did manage to get it out, though the uh, operator, I think, lost both boots getting out of the vehicle, uh, wading through the mud. Um, on other occasions, you know, things such as this, the um, uh, operator of this backhoe in the foreground got a little too close to the burn pile. He was not injured, though I do believe the backhoe was pretty much totally in fire uh, that, that engulfed it. But when things are done right, you end up with a nice, very bucolic uh, scene. Um, we plant uh, native vegetation uh, when this construction is done. And so uh, on a, a nice sunny day, a solar farm is a very pleasant, very quiet uh, play, place to be. Um, though they're not always so bucolic. This is a, a site we have in Minnesota. And there are certain times of the year where we don't generate a lot of electricity. Um, in, uh, from, from that site. Not only is it really cloudy, so there's not much snow, but there's or not much sunshine, but there's snow uh, co covering the array. Um, this was uh, winter of 2018, 2019, which turned out to be the third snowiest winter in the last 30 years. It also was the first winter we were operating, the first year we were operating the solar farm. Like, what the heck have we gotten into? Uh, last winter was not nearly so bad, so it was, it was much, much better. But Mother Nature can be cruel at times. This is a site here in North Carolina, uh, July or June of 2019. We had a hailstorm, hail the size of tennis balls. Now, the modules are designed to withstand hail up to about two centimeters, so you know, slightly less than an inch in size, which is typical. You know, and so, but when you get something the size of a tennis ball, um, you end up replacing about 3,000 modules across this site. So about 10% of the site just got shattered um, by, by Mother Nature. Um, other times here in North Carolina, you know, we're um, prone to hurricanes. And so in 2019, this is a site under construction. I'll tell you more after you watch the other uh, So watch closely. This is a video that was taken by one of the neighbors uh, on, on there, um, basically with their with their cell phone, but they shared it with us. So I'll show, show that to you again, just so you see what, what happened. Um, the arrays are designed to withstand temp uh, wind speeds of this. In fact, in a, in a zone such as this, they're designed to withstand 120, 120 miles per hour wind. What happened? was that it was under construction and the contractor, um, and when they pulled out the site, had not fully bolted everything down. And so the site was um, not fully secured. And as a result, this section, and fortunately, it was just this one section uh, pull, pulled out. Um, so when you build them, you got to make sure you build them right and all the way because you know they do need to stand out there. And they will stand out there for 20, 30 years um, in all sorts of weather. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about operations. But to give you some sense of what we do in solar, and I should have pointed out on that bar graph showing North Carolina, most of what's been built here in North Carolina is utility scale. Um, the large ground mount, you know, 40 to 200, 300, 400 acres uh, in size. But in other parts of the country, you see that and other sorts of things. And so some of the sites that we've built at Ecoplexus, this is the um, visitor center at Hearst Castle. Hearst Castle is um, sort of the West Coast equivalent of the Biltmore House, uh, a large robber baron facility. And so in the visitor center, we built you know, some carports for them right, right down on the coast of uh, California. Uh, here are Santa Clara County offices in, in um, Silicon Valley. Uh, again, some carports as well as rooftop to, count, to power the, uh, the, the county offices. We built these arrays, um, sold them to somebody else who now owns and, and operates them, and they then sell the, that electricity directly to the, the county in this particular case. Um, there's another one also uh, in the same county there. Um, nice place to put solar arrays. Nobody ever goes up on the roof of the water storage tanks there. So it's a good sunny place to, to put uh, arrays. Um, there's another one. I'm going to run another video here. Uh, this is at the California Department of Public Health, um, the California version of the CDC. Imagine they're a little bit busy right now. Um, but they're very proud of this carport. And uh, as you'll hear in the video they created um, and have on their website. <laughs> The 2.8 megawatt solar system will offset virtually all electrical usage annually at this facility. This will make the Richmond facility a zero net energy user. Just how much is 2.8 megawatts? That's enough energy to run 12,000 refrigerators for an entire year. That's enough to power an electric car 10 million miles per year. There are more than 9,700 solar world made in America solar panels. That number of panels would fit on approximately 500 Bay Area homes. This project created more than 35 local union prevailing wage jobs. The solar panels will be cleaned once or twice a year using recycled water. The solar panel cleaning will take two to three days. This solar carport canopy provides more than just shade for employees' cars. Over its lifetime, 55,000 tons of CO2 will be eliminated from our carbon footprint. That's like planting more than 1 million trees. That's like reducing driving by 110 million auto miles. That's 5.6 million gallons of gasoline. And that's like recycling 170,000 tons of waste instead of sending it to a landfill. Our carbon footprint just got smaller. We will displace CO2 emissions from the annual electrical use of 6,000 homes. That's equivalent to 26,000 tons of coal being burned. That's avoiding the use of 1 billion gallons of water by thermoelectric power plants. As you can tell from that video, they're very, very proud of their, their carport. Um, and it's a great way to use space. I mean, parking lots, obviously they have cars parked in them, but they use the space above them. And so you get du dual use out of it. Um, I want to shift now to the operations and the, you know, when we're operating a solar farm. I mean, what you see in front of you is um, typically what our, our control center is looking at um, when they're watching a solar farm. I've, I've chosen a picture here that's a full week. Normally they're not going to look at such a broad period of time, but it points out some of the things that you've seen about how a solar farm operates. Um, and you can see a number of things here. I'll, I'll point out first uh, November 1 here. Um, you'll notice this is a nice, typically clear, sunny day. Power comes up and, and, and you know, peaks out midday, solar noon, and then as the sun goes down uh, in the afternoon and evening. Um, and I should point out what, what, we're, what we're showing here is the DC uh, current in red and superimposed over that is the active power, the AC current that we're ex exporting uh, to, to the grid. Um, other days are not quite so smooth. We, we refer to this as a clear sky day um, when we can see full, full production. And, and let me point out one of the other things that, that occurs. Um, and, you know, this example on October 31 is a good example. You see that there's sort of a flat plateau at the top, same over here on the 28th, is that we actually reach the maximum output that the site's allowed to export to the grid, and so it clips. 
we still on occasion, you know, we basically are, are not harvesting all the energy so that we stay within the bounds that the utility can, with the power that the utility can accept. There are other days that are not quite so clean and smooth as November 1, over here on October 27. It looks like a pretty cloudy day. It looks like the sun peeked through around midday, but as you can see, pretty cloudy. October 28 was a obviously a mostly cloudy day where clouds were coming and going, and so the production went up and down a fair bit. Um, and that's what that is typical for uh, a single solar farm. When you aggregate solar together, you tend to smooth this out a fair bit. Um, but for those of you that are involved with utility operations or, or the like, it's, it's part of what the operating authority needs to do to manage uh, load um, and, and supply on the grid. Um, the other thing that we watch for is obviously weather. This is a snapshot from several years ago of Hurricane Michael. Unfortunately, our, those, those two pinpoints, F and J, the bottom of the um, screen there went right through, or the eye went right over those two sites. Fortunately, there was almost no damage. We had a, some of the modules, uh, no, no damage like you saw in the previous one. These were fully constructed, so they, they came through. We had a bit of damage to some of the modules, and so as soon as the roads were open the next day, we went down, disconnected those modules in the site. As soon as the sun came out, the site was up and operating. Uh, again, they're, they're pretty robust in what they do. Uh, the other pinpoints, you can see we're on the, the edge of the hurricane, didn't, didn't have nearly the amount of rain or, um, um, or, or wind that, that occurs. But they're, they're, they're really robust. I point out during this storm, um, the nuclear power plant that's down here right near um, um, Wilmington was actually taken offline for the better part of two weeks, about several days in advance of the hurricane and several days after it. And then the Cape Fear steam plant um, went offline when um, the, the uh, site flooded, and they were offline for a fair, fair bit of time. And so um, one of the things that solar industry likes to brag about is, is the, the robustness of the facilities that we build. But when you're also watching sites, there's some other unusual things that you might see. Another video, this was captured from some of our solar, or from our security cameras, watch closely here. And I'll run that again. Uh, this we refer to as our solar ghost that the security can, oops, didn't run. Let me try that again. There we go. And it's much more fun calling it a solar ghost than, rather than saying, oh, it's just a patch of fog that came out on a, on a humid night. So it's fun. Um, but that's what our main our operations group does is they they watch the sites, you know, through instrumentation, in some cases, such as this one, through, through cameras, um, and monitor what's going on in the sites. They keep track of people who are coming and going, you know, and keeping a log of all the events that occur the site. And when something needs to be done, they call upon our maintenance team, which then gets out to the sites. They'll do corrective maintenance where it's required, and obviously the team preventative maintenance, particularly the inverters that needs to be done. Um, and I'll show you another clip from some of our maintenance and some of the maintenance activities that we do, and then I'll talk about them after this, this clip. As you saw there, we use drones for some of our maintenance work. Uh, the picture that you saw in the video clip was of modules that are all working properly. We wouldn't put anything else on our website. Um, but here's an example of a picture where it um, shows the value of the thermal imaging that we can do with the drone. Um, as you can see there, there, there are two modules that have bright stripes on them. This is indicative of what's called a bypass diode failure. The you know, modules have bypass diodes, and if you want to dive into the details, I'll be happy to talk about it. But basically what you're seeing here is a third of these two modules is not properly working. It's not generating electricity. It's being bypassed. Um, and because that energy is um, being absorbed but not turned into electricity, that part of the module is hotter. 
We can see entire modules that are out. Uh, for some reason, a string of modules, 19 modules that are strung together in series. You know, if a fuse is blown or something of that sort, we can see that and then direct our uh, maintenance crews to go out and, and fix those sorts of things. Um, drone imagery and drones have been a great add to our arsenal, our set of tools in the last five years. Previously, we'd have to go around on foot and measure, put, basically put a voltmeter um, on, on individual strings, a very laborious and time consuming one. But now we can, in the course of an hour or two, fly the site and get a really good sense of what's happening on the DC side, what's happening in the array field. Um, you also saw in that, in that video, um, some of our mowing crew. Um, we have a couple sites where we do sheep. It's a great deal. But the sheep get fodder and we get um, the weeds kept in check. Um, one of the issues is how do you keep the sheep safe? And that's what's on the left side there. Um, things you learn in the solar industry that you didn't know before, but burrows do not like dogs and foxes and coyotes and will basically attack them and chase them away. And so in this fenced in solar array, um, they put two burrows along with the sheep, um, and uh, the burrows keep the sheep safe. And they make, they're very friendly, as you can see, with one of our project managers there, made a buddy, or either that or he has a carrot in his back pocket, I'm not sure which. Um, but some of the other things that we do um, in terms of managing sites and the way they're designed and built, uh, I'll go back to this uh, American Legion site, it's on American Legion Road, the American Legion Huts right, right there. Um, is we put um, wildlife corridors uh, through them. You know, if we were to fence all the way around this, this would be a real barrier to the movement of wildlife. So as you can see, there are two corridors through here. It's to some degree making lemons out of lemonade. These are wetlands in any case. We, we couldn't build in them. Um, and, but we leave, you know, vegetation, in this case, trees standing and fence alongside of them so that the wildlife can go through. The fences we use also have fairly large four inch openings um, so that smaller animals can pass through. We have critter cams on some of the sites where we've seen um, foxes that can pass through. It's, the coyotes are a little too large. They can't get through the fence, um, nor can deer, um, but the smaller rabbits, raccoons, possum, and the like can, can get through. Um, and then on the site, as you saw in a previous photo, we sow pollinator friendly. Um, vegetation. We, we try to promote native, uh, low-growing vegetation, which helps minimize the mowing that we do as well. And on several of the sites, some in here in North Carolina, some in Minnesota, we've actually partnered with apiaries, apiaries who are beekeepers, um, and we actually have um, bees on several sites. And, um, they harvest the honey and sell that um, from the sites. Um, and when all is said and done, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes you get a shot like this at a solar farm where you get to see you know, the, the splendor of the, of the sunshine. Um, and I will finish with a quiz. What time of year was this picture taken? I hope it's a little more obvious. Um, again, solar modules face south, which means the geese are headed north, which would suggest it's springtime. Um, and with that, I'll finish and be happy to enter. Oh, someone sent a text in. Thank you. Uh, and, and said spring. Um, I'll close out and be happy to answer any questions. Yes, there is one in the chat box, John. Um, it says, how do you select the site to set up a solar farm? And what is the what are the biggest challenges to procure real estate? And then it goes on to ask, are solar farms coupled with other businesses to use uh, improve land usage? Um, we have a whole real estate team that, that finds sites. Uh, the first criteria, um, there, there are two. One, it has to be buildable. Um, and, and the second is it has to be at a point where we can interconnect to the grid. Uh, obviously, we need to be able to export the power and, and get um, and sell the power that we're generating. And so uh, we work with landowners. Um, uh, Ecoplexus has, in the past, has deployed uh, folks typically using Google Earth to identify substations and, and look for plots of land and go through public record and contact landowners and, and enter into a you know, lease option with them. Because the time to do an interconnection study to see if indeed you can connect with the grid at that point um, and go through permitting and the like can be as long as uh, two, three years. Um, and so we do that work. 
uh, and the point where we get an interconnection study back and, and the interconnection cost is reasonable and we think we can make the project work, then we enter into a lease of a transaction with, with the landowner. Um, if I remember, Kelly, the other part of the question is other uses of the land. You, you saw we do sheep, we do native vegetation. Um, those are the, the two that we deploy at this point. There are some people who are talking about agrivoltaics where they're actually growing crops um, in addition to it, sometimes that requires a higher you know, array further off the ground. Um, uh, I'm a little bit wary of that since I'm in the maintenance end of that because the minute you put crops on it, it means you're putting machinery to tend those crops. And we have enough trouble with the crews that go out and just mow the grass and running into the array and damaging things. So you have more equipment out there is not something that I'm a fan of, though certainly those that figure out how to do that well so we can do that. And Kelly, did that answer all that? There was a multi-part question that answered all the parts of that question. Yes, looks like you did. All right. Any others? There was uh, uh, that one question, uh, what are the biggest challenges to your region? Biggest challenges for locating a site or for? Um, uh, to In order to um, you know, justify the land versus the cost and all that. I mean, what are the challenges that people or governments pose? Well, there there are, there, unfortunately, there, there's some areas where they take a dim view of solar. Um, they, they're not you know, um, impressed by the, the financial benefits from tax base and, and, and to the landowners. And so we do see local jurisdictions that do restrict it. Um, in some cases, they put um, zoning requirements. We, we typically, there's, these are non-standard uses for the land. The land is typically not zoned for this. And so we have to go through a zoning hearing and, and have the zoning change. And that's an occasion for local officials and neighbors to, uh, to oppose it. And so in some cases, they, they put on rather onerous restrictions. Uh, we had a site, we do have a site in, uh, in Kartok out on the coast that was a former golf course and been out of business for a decade or so. Um, and we proposed to come in and put a solar farm on it. The local folks, the jurisdiction said we needed to have uh, a hundred, a 300 foot setback, which meant that we couldn't put nearly as large a solar farm on there as we wanted to. Um, uh, that basically just is, you know, a setback from the lot line to the array, long, you know, as long as a football field. Um, and so we ended up using that space. The site had a flooding problem before we got there. And so we used that space to make uh, drainage uh, ponds. And now the uh, geese and ducks that fly on the Atlantic Flyway find it to be a very convenient place to uh, make a stopover. Um, so we, again, managed to turn lemons into the lemonade in, in that regard. Um, but there are some jurisdictions where we simply can't overcome that opposition. And they put restrictions on it that just make it financially infeasible for us to do it. And so we move on and we find other locations where we can. Um, it's, it's, I'm always surprised by that. I will acknowledge that I am biased in favor of solar. Um, but in terms of other uses of the land, I mean, solar makes no noise. It requires no traffic. Um, it doesn't call upon additional services of water and sewer for the local jurisdiction. We do ask that the sheriff drive by on occasion and let us know if something's amiss um, there. But from the local jurisdiction, it's, it's pretty much um, a very benign uh, neighbor. Uh, in most cases, the, 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 there is no noise, um, the, the inverse hum. Um, and, but if you're about 40 feet away from that, um, you can barely hear them. And, and cars passing by make, you know, on a road nearby make fun, much more noise than that. So from a standpoint of, you know, being a good neighbor, solar farms are, are, are pretty quiet and, and benign. There's a question that is, uh, what are the biggest regulatory challenges you're seeing right now? Um, the, the biggest one, and this is around the country, not just here in North Carolina, is indeed how we get access to the grid. Um, and, and that so that regulation is, is typically with the utilities commissions uh, in the state. Um, we 
Ecoplexus and other companies like us are, are independent power producers. Um, we are, in some cases, selling power to the utilities, but in many cases, um, like the ones you saw in California there, we sell to the end user, um, directly to the end user. And the ones that you saw in Minnesota, we sell to subscribers. It's, the community, it's called a community solar program. Uh, and so the utilities are um, not really happy to have us there. We're sort of the encroaching upon what they perceive to be their marketplace and their territory. And so they use the regulatory requirements of utilities commissions to try to stymie solar. Um, and so we have on occasions, you know, if, if, if we don't feel the utilities are, are playing by the rules, if they are using their interconnection study process in a way that we think violates the, the standards that have been set, we will file a, a protest and, and take it to the commission. Um, and, um, and so that we can have the right to build and operate. And so that's, that's probably the, the biggest um, area where, where we get pushback. Um, it really depends upon the, the local jurisdiction and how, um, you know, and that, that may be at the state level as well, um, in terms of how the electricity market is run. Here in North Carolina, um, they do not allow third-party sales of energy. And so the only customers that we have for electricity are the utilities in Duke and Dominion uh, pr primarily. And so how the price is set, and that is set by the commission, um, um, how the price is set there, it's called avoided cost, um, really matters. And so in some states, North Carolina has had it in the past a reasonable cost that allows us to do projects financially that are financially viable. Other states set an avoided cost that is, is so low that it's, it's impossible to build solar there. And so you see that again, that's primarily at the uh, commission. By and large, from an environmental standpoint, land use standpoint, um, solar is very, very benign. We, we, you know, it's a construction site. We go through, um, uh, you know, various environmental permitting. And uh, one of the other things that we did, you know, we, you can see the erosion control basins that are on the site. They're baffle fences. You know, there's a semicircular one here and a rectangular one under the cursor there. Um, and so we, you know, we have to get a stormwater pollution prevention permit, you know, from here in North Carolina, it's the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. We have to, you know, you know, do the inspections and report on sediment control and the like while the site's under construction. We have to do, do all of that uh, sort of thing. We then have to establish, you know, ground cover so that we don't have runoff and erosion and the like. So, so all the basic, you know, regulations regard, you know, regarding construction apply to what we do as, as well. Um, uh, they're reasonable, you know, that we can reasonably comply with them. There's nothing that really prevents us from doing things, but it's it's yeah, complying with all the environmental regulations that are just general uh, as well. Anything else? It uh, looks like there's one more. It says, what do you think of solar roadways and other such techno technological advances and its future in the US? Yeah, that's been one that people have talked about. Um, the, the notion that you would drive, I mean, there, there are two different ones. One is where the it's, it's embedded in the pavement and vehicles drive over it. Um, it always strikes me as you're creating a huge challenge for yourself um, in terms of creating um, a material. This, this is a semiconductor material. Um, it, it's essentially very pure silicon. Um, and, and you then have to put a base that keeps it absolutely inflexible so it doesn't crack because if you have cracking, it then inhibits the movement of the electrons that, that you're trying to generate. So I've never understood the notion that you would create solar paving. Um, there also have been folks who have proposed building solar along highways. Um, and it's right now a bit problematic um, in that the solar is still expensive enough that the additional cost of creating the collection cabling you know, typically you would have a very long and narrow array. And as you can see here in the picture on the screen, we try to make these as compact as possible to minimize the amount of cabling and the um, uh, location of the string inverters, um, excuse me, of the central inverters, uh, the, those pads that you see these, these cutouts right here. Um, so, you know, it's 
that you add cost when you get away from a relatively compact um, configuration. And so I, I'm, and then there's the issue of you're, you're, you're putting an object in the vehicles that you're off the road will run into. And so the whole liability insurance issue that goes along with it. Um, I have seen some that have been built in the areas in clover leaves that make sense. But that's a relatively constrained area, and there are economies to scale to building these things. And so if you're doing it on a cost-effective basis, that can be a bit of a challenge of doing that. Though where place where land is constrained, it may make sense. The other thing you see in, in many other countries where land is um, constrained is what's called photovoltaics, where they actually float them typically in reservoirs. And so use the surface of a reservoir um, to um, construct essentially a raft and then um, put, put the array on top of that. Okay, well, John, thank you so much for uh, being with our group today.